Depending on how you measure it, about one in 10 people in Ontario lives in poverty. Most of us don't know what that looks or feels like, but we often make assumptions nonetheless. Journalist Deborah Dundas does know what that's like, and her new book, simply titled On Class, invites readers to learn why hearing the stories from those who live them can be transformative. Deborah Dundas is also the book's editor at the Toronto Star, and she joins us now in the studio of her former employer. It's been a long time, Welcome Steve. Back, nice Deb. to see Welcome you back. again. Yes, let's do the full disclosure thing off the top. You and I used to work on a TV show here. Very closely, Studio 2. Absolutely. And we palled around a bit, you we know. Did. I we remember did. getting a lift in that <laughs> cute little car ears with no top. I had an MGB. You did. An old MGB. And we went to St. Catharines, wasn't it? To see it? a Stompers baseball game. Absolutely. On it was so much fun. Freezing cold night. And you really wanted to show me how the car how worked life with the was top with down. The top down, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was cold. Anyways, the, I, I raise all that because as well as I knew you and as much time as we spent together, I knew nothing of your background. And I wonder if that was by design. Not everybody knew about my background because why would I talk about it? You know, why would I talk about growing up in poverty? Why would I talk about the little indignities that I grew up with? because I didn't want to be going back into that life. I wanted to try and create a new life, to fit into a new life somewhere else. But I'll ask you the flip side of the question. Yeah. You ask, why would I want to talk about that? Why wouldn't you want to talk about that? People often talk about their backgrounds, especially with, with people they work with and know well. But you know, I think people don't like to talk about things they're ashamed of. And very often, people who are poor feel shame from being poor. They feel that they're not going to fit in. They try to... Um, I was at a cocktail party. I mentioned this in the book. It's better with an example than... So I was at a cocktail party, and you know, a couple of years ago, and the conversation turned to back-to-school shopping. Mm -hmm. And um, they were talking about buying backpacks and the price of backpacks and, you know, buying pencil crayons. And it just make, made me think of when I was a kid. and. I wanted Laurentian pen pencil crayons, and I could never have them because they were too expensive. Backpacks, no. I remember, you know, clogs, all the all the fashion things, all the things that you want to fit in with your peers, you never have. So it's always about wanting, and also um, sometimes you're made fun of. You know, I mean, we didn't sometimes have. Um, you know, quarters to put into the washing machine to do laundry, so my clothes would smell of cat pee, and people would say. You stink. Yeah, but that was then. That wasn't here. Did you have any reason to suspect that you'd be teased because of your background here in the workplace? No, but you know, I think what you do is you internalize these feelings and you don't want to talk about them because when you're talking to other people about their background, you know, going back to the pencil crayons, mm. I didn't bring that up, that conversation in the, um, in the cocktail party because it's a downer, you know, or I assume it's going to be a downer. Oh, I'm going to talk about what I didn't have as opposed to what I did have. There's not really a, a point where we're going to relate, you know? You're, you feel that you're going to be judged. You, you just, you don't want to go back there. Were you ashamed of your background? Um, I wasn't ashamed of my background. So often people would say, who did know, would say, well, look at you. You know, look at what you became. You, you managed to, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And I always, right? I I, th there they are there on the cover they, of the there book. There they are there on are the, the cover bootstraps. of the book. But I think that's, um, I never liked that argument because I didn't want to be exceptional because I didn't think I was exceptional. Um, um, you know, yes, you, yes, I worked hard and, and, and all of that, but I was also, I had a few lucky breaks. And, you know, that got me um, to, to where I am, you know? And that's, I think, what people don't look at very often is the lucky breaks that, that, that get you to different places, you know? We talk a lot about race in yeah. society today. We talk a lot yeah. about gender in society today. Is it harder to talk about class still? I think it's harder to talk about class because it's um, nobody wants nobody wants to talk about it, right? People at the upper end um, are afraid of being maligned. People at the lower end are afraid are, are afraid of being judged or are ashamed. So it's something that we just kind of kind of 
talk around, you know. Um, and I also think that there's not a way to talk about it. There are very few ways ways in to talk about it. So what I try to do in this book is get a variety of different people talking about their backgrounds and how we can find touchstones that are non-judgmental to talk about where we are and where we've come from. And you also say in the book that the pandemic gave us an in point to sure. start talking about class in a way we haven't before. Sure. Did we, did we do that, in fact? Um, I don't, I think we could have done that. So I think we, we still can do that. Hmm. I don't think we talked about it as much as we could. I think we're talking about it more. Um, I mean, what, what the pandemic showed us was how um, people of the lower classes, um, they ended up doing all the hard work. They were essential workers. They. Um, they did. They still had to go to work. They were dying at at, at um, you know rates. higher rates. Yep. Sure, than, than than everybody else. And what would what would the rest of us do? Is we'd go out in our porches and bang our pots and pans and say, "You guys are heroes." Great. What what the heck does that mean? So they're they're heroes for what? For giving their lives so that the rest of us didn't have to leave our our you know comfortable little places. You know maybe that should be acknowledged. Um, maybe that needs to be talked about. I think Dr. I Isaac Bogosh actually said one of the things about the pandemic is is how how um, how these issues of inequality became much more visible and and definable, right? Measurable in many ways. Well, he did say saw it in your book, yep. he did say the pandemic gave us an opportunity to talk about inequalities as it relates to housing yep. and working conditions and yep. overall treatment of people in society. Yep. And it happened a little bit, but it doesn't seem to have stuck. No. Uh, now that, I mean, I won't say life has gone back to normal. Uh, Not quite, cause, but cause, yeah. But, you know, the pandemic is more under control right now. Uh, we seem to have sort of, many of us anyway, checked that whole discussion sure. in the background and you know, we've gone through it. Missed opportunity? I think it is a missed opportunity, to tell you the truth, because um, people are still living that way. I mean, look at, look at, we, you know, we gave pandemic pay, mm. and then it was taken away once the pandemic was over. Um, they're not still heroes mm. <laughs> for doing that. They don't still deserve it. Um, you know, um, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't really make any sense. I speak to a couple of people in the book. One, um, her name is Lise. She actually was an occupational therapist um, and decided to take a job, you know, sort of semi-retired from that, um, and took a job as a cashier. And all her friends, who were sort of more middle class, looked down on her and said, well, why are you doing that? You don't have to do that. She, she said, because I like it, mm. you know? But there's 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 a snobbery around it, and she was quite aware, you know, um, driving driving to work and seeing the hero signs, you know, as she was driving to work, talking, you know, thinking how how long is it going to be until these signs come down, until it goes back to normal, you know, to the way it was, that, which is our normal, mm -hmm. um, and 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 it didn't take that long. It only took a couple of months before the signs came down. You look at a PSW. I spoke with them. Um, Sherry, um, you know, she, her union um, managed to get the um, the pandemic pay as as a more um, permanent uh, permanent pay rise. So you know, but if there's no one fighting, um, then then we're just kind of going, okay, well, let's go back to what it was. None of us wants to remember the pandemic, I guess. Well, I wonder and is we, that why. You know? is is that why it's happened? Because I, you know, fancy people who live in the cities, yeah. for the first time maybe in a very long time, thought about how the food actually gets to their supermarket. They right. thought about the truck driver who drives it in and then the stalkers who put it on the yeah. shelves and the, you know, the checkout uh, clerk who you know, gets you on your way. Absolutely. These are people who they might not normally think of very much. That's right. But, but you don't think that has legs, eh? You think we've just sort of gone back to the way it was now? I don't think it's quite that, that uh, distinct, no. I mean, I think we've moved forward and I think what we need to do is work to keep the conversation going. That, that I do think. Um, and I think this is happening internationally as well. It's not just happening here. Hmm. You looked into the background of class in the book. Where does the whole notion come from to begin with? Um, you know, in the late sort of 1700s, 1800s is, is when the word class started being, started being used more. Um, and I think Marx put, put class into the, um, our uh, relationship to the means of production or to the land or to, or to you know, um, others in society. So that's where the sort of class as we know it started, 
started coming up. There was um, an interesting um, group of people, the Toll Puddle Martyrs, who were in the um, in the in the UK. It was a group of men, um, and they um, they got together to protest. Uh, the pitiful wages that that farm workers were were getting because they were being underpaid and um, the landed gentry didn't want to pay them more so there were there were riots the landed gentry said okay well maybe we'll start paying you more um, mm. if you stop rioting that happened they stopped and the um, and the, uh, the the they took the wages away again so you know so these toll puddle martyrs got together and uh, created the, what was basically the first union. And so they signed this pledge to the union, and uh, uh, one one of the uh, one of the establishment um, said, "Arrest them! They're not allowed to pledge a union, un pledge to to an organization." So they were arrested, deported to Australia. There was so much pro protest they came back and ended up here in Canada and actually near uh, near London. Hmm. And they're they're buried there, are and they they're not? Buried yeah, there. the they're cemetery buried there, is there, right? Yeah. So, but that's that's a history of of class and the labor movement, and that we don't know about. So, I think so often that sort of history gets hidden um, because people don't. Again, people don't talk about it because who tells who tells the stories? <clears throat> well, you know? it, it kind of, I guess, it reflects a bit how we we. People identify themselves in many different ways, yep. right? I mean, they yep. define themselves by their gender, by their religion, yep. by their... Anyway, uh, on and on and on. Uh, racial lines. Absolutely. Not so much class. Not so much class. Is that not a good way to organize ourselves in society? Um, I don't know. Uh, not a good way. Do you know, um, we hear a lot about the middle class. Hmm. Okay, because everybody wants to be in the middle class. Prime Minister talks about it all the time. Prime Minister middle talks class about it. and those aiming to join it. And what the heck does the middle class even mean, mm. right? I mean, he appointed a minister of the middle class, and she couldn't even define what the middle class was, right? right? I mean, and came under, you know, a, a, a lot of a lot of uh, laughter for for some of some of the comments that that she made about it. But the thing is, there's there's a stickiness. I've you know the OECD, um, various um, economists have looked at the idea of class and you know through income basically um, and there's the lower sort of 10 percent or so 10 to 15 percent um, who stay poor and the higher spectrum they they tend to stay rich right there's not a lot of uh, mobility either way but the middle class um, it's it's all over the place. I think the definition is, and don't quote me on that, but the numbers are in here. The definitions are something like you know forty five thousand to one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. It's pretty broad. It's pretty broad. Yeah. One hundred and sixty thousand dollars versus forty five thousand dollars in this city. It's going to mean the difference being able to buy yourself a little condo mm -hmm. or potentially being homeless on the street because you can't find rent you can afford. I mean that's middle class. So um, you know it's um, it's something that people like. To be, I mean, the rich will very often wealthier people will identify as middle class because mm. they don't want to be seen as being as being rich, mm. you know. And poor people don't want to be seen as being poor, and it's aspirational. Well, we're all part of the middle class. There's a little bit of a breakdown to to working class, you know. Um, so so people will identify with working class, um, and and that's okay. But you know, it's um, that that middle class is very very difficult. Mm. I was talking to someone the other day who. Um, by 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 chance lives in in Rosedale. I'm not sure what the what his um, the background to why he lives there is. But he was saying that a lot of his neighbors, who took private jets, who took private jets during the pandemic to get the heck out of Dodge because they didn't have to, um, th there were no quarantines or mm. they identify as middle class. I and mean, he, I'm sorry, if you're taking a private jet, are you middle class? You know, if you fall into the, you know, into those economic, uh, maybe so. I wouldn't have but thought I admit so. I wouldn't have thought so, no. right? Uh, I'm not going to name names here, but what do you think of populist politicians who uh, bang a drum pretty hard for tapping into class grievances and that kind of thing? I don't think they're doing anybody a service, um, and I think it's unfortunate. If, if we look uh, south of the border, for example, or at examples here, those politicians hold themselves up to be the common guy. Um, 
there's been such a there, there and again you know there have been various people and articles and studies I've, I've, I've sort of examined in here but um, you know the working class and and poor people aren't aren't voting um, you know liberal anymore and they tend to be voting more conservative these days and the flip side has happened the intellectuals are are more um, going towards you know liberals and and the working class how do I put this? Um, and people are seeing that as the intellectual elites, and they don't trust the intellectual elites because, in part, they don't aspire to be an intellectual elite. They don't want to be a merchant banker. They don't want to be a university professor. But if they look at the self-made guy, the so-called self-made guy, you know, I can be like that. And so, you know, it creates this mythology of... of um, of being able to, to reach that. Now, none of the politicians that we might be referring to here were self-made by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a mythology they like to keep going because it suits them. Are they false prophets? I mean, they certainly talk a good game about helping people who don't have get more. Well, okay, Do they? Look, at it, look at equality, look at inequality right now. I don't mm. think it does. I want to uh, ask you about, once again, this picture on the front of the book, because there is this mythology, I guess, mm -hmm. that, you know, this country is so fair, and the United States, of course, is built on this. Uh, our countries are so fair that all you've got to do is, you know, tighten your, <laughs> pull your socks up a little higher. That's right. You know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and whatever, <clears throat> and, and you too can be a success in life. And if you not, if you're not, it's your own fault, mm -hmm. right? So what does that do? That just reinforces the system. Look, we've put the system in place. The system's there. Look at Look at, look at Deborah. Look at any number of people. They did it. Why can't you do it? Well, I was going to ask that. I mean, you, you turned out, you've turned out okay. Yeah, I have. And, and that's absolutely fine. I also know a lot of people who didn't. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone's going to be the book's editor at the Star. Not everybody even wants to be. Not everybody mm -hmm. wants to be the host of the agenda. Not everybody wants to be a banker. And mm -hmm. And you know, all of us have the things that we're that we're going to do. And why should anybody else who isn't um, aspiring to those higher things have to live with a lack of dignity? I'm not talking about um, you know equality across the board. I'm not ta talking about you know that sort of thing. But what I am talking about is everybody needs to be able to treat each other with dignity. You should not in this country. Um, Half, I spoke to a woman named Karen, and she worked all her life. Um, she's in her mid-50s, um, had some health problems, had some drinking problems when she was younger, but she still, you know, she, she, she got clean. She did everything you're supposed to do. Finished high school, didn't go on to further education, but she held jobs for the past 30 years. Generally, you know, she's looking for work around $20 an hour. She is, you know, um, maybe an average working class person. She recently um, got some health issues, so she left her job to try and deal with the health, sh health issues, went on EI. She had a little bit of savings, but not a ton, because, you know, if you're not making a ton, you can't save a ton. Mm -hmm. um, and now she went to get disability insurance, or ODSP, right, mm -hmm. the Ontario Disability <clears throat> Support. And um, she was worried that she wasn't going to get it, because so many people don't get it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's denied. Um, and then on appeal, they get it. So there's this, this problem in the system as well. But she went to this, the, the worker that you have to go through a social worker to do these things. Um, she was talking to the worker and the worker put her on Ontario Works, which used to be welfare. called welfare. Yeah. yeah. And um, she said, but that won't even pay my rent. And the woman said to her, well, go to a hostel, go to a rooming house. Should somebody who worked all their life because they had health problems not have enough to pay the rent, she hasn't done anything wrong. That's bad luck, right? That's a lack of privilege. There's nobody there who to, to back her up. Did she go to university? No. Does everybody have to go to university? No. You know, the idea that, that, that everything always has to be grasping for more and more and more, um, 
that's 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 a problem. Not mm. everybody can. Not everybody should. What about the the you know the, the whole idea of trickle down economics, which is you know um, that's a, that's a whole conversation for another day. But what about what about maintaining all of us? Um, you know, does, is she asking to be rich? No. Is she asking to be given, you know, no, she's, she's asking to stay in her apartment. That's a low rent apartment, but it's been the place that she's lived for 30 years. And why should she be booted out on the street for that, potentially, just because she got sick? It's a myth that that only happens in the U.S. Can I ask you another personal question? Mm. Okay. You tell us a lot about your background, and 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 you did you had a very hard scrabble background. Mm -hmm. You're now the books editor of the Toronto Star. Mm -hmm. That's a very nice job. It is. And you you know you get invited to a lot of the very fancy pants things in this city that I, I do. You know, and I wonder how, how you sort of how do you how do you sort of negotiate that that um, real dichotomy in your own head of where you came from and where you are. And the fact that uh, I think a lot of the people you probably hang around with now don't spend a lot of time thinking about the people in this book. The people I hang around with professionally, right? So mm -hmm. my personal life and my professional life different are different not entirely different obviously there's crossover yeah. and I've got a lot of friends who are who are friends who are but it's not it's not quite as stark. Um, having said that you know, I know as I'm going to these things, do I belong? I belong because of my position. Do I belong because of me? I still don't feel I belong because of me. Seriously? Yeah. You walk into these yeah. galas or cocktail parties yeah. or whatever, and you still think, I'm Deborah Dundas from the wrong side of the tracks, what am I doing here? Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's, I don't, I don't, I feel if I wasn't in the position I'm in, that that would disappear. But that goes for all of us. Well, you know what, and, and, that's, and that's true too. I think it's more true for some people than it is for others maybe, but I still feel that way. Hmm. You know, and maybe we all feel that way, but maybe that's something we should be talking about. Well, let's talk about it, because right? I can tell you, I can tell you, it was at least 25, maybe 30 years ago, former Premier David Peterson once yeah. said to me, you know, you, you get invited to a lot of nice things because of the job you've got, but believe me, as soon as you don't have that job, you're falling off everybody's invitation list and get That's ready right. for it. And he's absolutely right, absolutely. and I've known that for ages. Yep. So, uh, but, now I did not grow up in the kind of poverty you did, and yet I don't have any doubts that once I'm not doing this job, you know, I'm not getting invited to this stuff anymore. No. And I, and I won't belong in that in those places anymore. But then maybe what we're talking about at that point is policymakers and the people who have power and how they're they're wielding it. I mean, some of the things I go to um, raise money um, for the for not just the arts, but for things like the public library mm. or you know various others, other other you know other worthy causes. Um, so if you if you go to a place like that and you've got people doing there's silent auction stuff, but then there's the the stuff where people can raise their hands and go, yeah, I'll give you twenty five thousand dollars as if it's nothing, you know, um, or they're 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 one upping each other. Mm -hmm. That's 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 all great, but um, they're making decisions about where the money goes, about whether programs are going to be funded, um, you know. Uh, so let me come full circle way? on this. Yeah. Do you long for a day? when you will be able to walk into one of those fancy pants cocktail parties and think to yourself, Deborah, you belong here. That would be, that would be kind of cool. And I, I, but I don't feel as if I don't belong as, as, a, as a person. I just feel as if I don't belong. I don't know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, hmm. it's tricky, it's tricky. But Ain't the it whole though? But the whole conversation is tricky. But if we can, you know, again, if we can talk about it, if we can talk to the Karens of this world or the Sherrys or the Lises of this world and understand what they go through. And if those people, you know, who are writing those big checks can understand or making the policy more importantly, can actually understand the live ex lived experience of others, then I think that, that makes a difference, right? Then we can actually talk to each other. I was going to say, you've done a marvelous job really kickstarting uh, a long overdue and very important conversation about all of these things. And it's a great read. Congratulations to you. Thanks so much, Steve. I Deborah appreciate Dundas, it. on class with the bootstraps right there on the cover. Mm. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Steve.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.